We are here with NAR Ganapathy, in, and we're going deep in Windows. And NAR is an architect for the I.O. manager and a kernel. How are you doing? Thanks for, for talking to us. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, so um, I own a part of the kernel called the I.O. manager. Um, so um, as you might know, the I.O. manager is really the the, the component that sets the I.O. architecture for Windows. So whenever you call like a, any uh, when an application does any sort of file I/O, reading and writing files, um, you know, downloading something from the camera, or you know, um, you know, showing something on the screen, you know, um, it goes through the I/O subsystem, and um, so it's a very core part of Windows, and it's also the um, the component that exposes the driver model. So it is a it, it produces the fundamental. Um, it, it actually sets the the framework for uh, writing a driver in Windows. So um, in addition, um, I am also the architect for um, driver model in Windows. So um, as time has evolved, um, or as Windows has evolved over time, um, our, we, we, we find the necessity to evolve the driver model as well. Um, the devices that, that the IO manager was originally designed for devices in 1989 and 1990 and around that time frame. And the devices we see now are very different from the devices uh, it was already designed for, mm -hmm. and so um, we find that you know there are a lot more devices. You know there are a lot more variety of devices, and um, um, and there are a lot of drivers. Um, so if you look at the I/O system when it was originally designed and the driver model, it was not designed for having like tens of thousands of drivers. Um, so I/O nowadays drivers are actually on part of the application. There are lots of drivers. People are writing drivers outside Microsoft, mm -hmm. and um, so we should actually. These days, treat drivers in a, in a very similar manner to applications. Hmm. Whereas in the past, um, drivers were this esoteric, you know, um, community who used to who used to know all the details of the kernel, who had very um, key access to the kernel developers and could write drivers. Um, it's not true anymore. Um, we need to have platforms, frameworks, libraries, tools, you know, much like Visual Studio. So, um, so my team was formed. Uh, I have a team too, and uh, my team is working on. Um, improving the driver model um, so that we get better quality drivers written for Windows. So I'm, my team has um, providing driver frameworks and other libraries, as well as many tools. Um, so I can talk about that um, Please. Please. in the future. Fantastic. So uh, about my background, um, so I, 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 I'm not a long time in Microsoft. I've been here only for six years. Uh, but before that, I was I was exclusively in Unix. So ah. I do bring a Unix perspective um, to Windows. Uh, I worked on uh, many aspects of Unix. I've ported uh, many versions of Unix. I've also worn uh, key parts of memory management in Unix. Um, so in the past, uh, I was at uh, Silicon Graphics and worked on IRIX and supported multiple page sizes, um, general purpose support for multiple page sizes. Um, so I worked on different parts of the operating system. Um, so working in IO is like a very interesting job. Now, that brings up an interesting point. When we talk about the Unix kernel and, and the Windows kernel, they're relatively similar uh, in, their, in their core design in that they're macro mm -hmm. kernels, right. et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so for, in your particular branch, how, how much has it evolved since NT4? Um, so the basic I.O. model hasn't evolved as much. Um, but I, I should say that um, the, there are uh, in a, in in I/O there is a very significant difference between Unix and NT, right? Um, uh, for example, the NT I/O model is fundamentally asynchronous, mm -hmm. and it, the layering is built into the I/O system. Um, so in uh, and at least in the Unixes I used to work with, um, we never had a dedicated I/O subsystem. There used to be the kernel and the file system was part of the kernel. And the devices were attached as a file system, uh, as part of a special file system, um, at least in uh, System Fab Release 4. Uh, whereas in NT, there is a well-defined layered architecture for I.O. And um, the I.O. subsystem is part of the kernel, and the file system is really just another driver that plugs into the I.O. subsystem. So it's actually much more modular. Um, and so, in fact, I would say that um, the original NT designers, when they design I.O., the fact that they made it so flexible is what has held us until now. The fact that Windows has evolved and it's supporting so many different types of devices is um, is because of the original uh, layered um, design of uh, I/O subsystem. Um, but what we are doing now is actually um, trying to um, 
provide richer frameworks um, for writing drivers in, in the kernel. Um, so, so for example, you know, uh, since the NTI system is fundamentally asynchronous um, and we have added plug and play power management, um, the model has become really complex. So if you want to write a driver for Windows, um, it's much harder now because you have to write code to handle plug and play, you know, arrival and removal of devices, um, code to handle power management, you know, what happens when you hibernate the machine, you know, put the machine to sleep, um, code to handle um, asynchronous I.O. and so on. And it turned out that um, while the system provided all the basic hooks, um, it left the drivers to implement all the, most of the code. So even though you were writing a simple driver and you really didn't care much about um, power management, mm -hmm. or really didn't care much about plug and play, uh, then you still had to write all the code. So uh, this meant that every driver had, had to carry lots of code and they typically were cut and pasted and they had errors and all those things. So we are coming up with a framework which is built on top of the IO system where we do a lot of heavy lifting for the driver developer. Right? And this is called the, the Windows Driver uh, Foundation. Um, and in fact, yeah, this has been announced at WinHack. Okay. Um, and what we are trying to do is, um, you can now, it's just like the .NET framework. It's, it's, in fact, they, we stole a lot of ideas from .NET framework. Uh -huh. um, so we have a, uh, the original IO system was actually not a, a completely object-oriented system. You know, it was, it was meant for low-level access, high performance, high throughput, and those kind of things, um, which were important in, in 1989. But in 2000, you know, interface design and abstraction is much more important, um, in my opinion, at least. And so we are, uh, we are actually providing an object-oriented model. Um, there, there are very well-defined interfaces. You know, in fact, we all our interfaces have methods, events, and properties. Um, oh. You know, very similar to what. In fact, you could take our model, and you know, you could imagine writing the code in C sharp, right? Uh -huh. But when the code is still in C, because of the kernel, we still need to write it in a managed code because that is the support we have in the kernel, but you know, the abstraction, the model is very similar. Fantastic. So that brings us into the next point. Uh, your team is doing work and experimenting with managed code. Uh, a little bit, yes. Thinking about yes. it. And uh, that's an interesting concept, in, in other words, to have type safety and verifiability mm -hmm. in the kernel. Right. But of course, there's a performance consideration with the GC. Right. Well, there are two, two or three problems. Um, so with managed code in the kernel, uh, we have a person in my team who is very passionate about it, and he really wants to get it done, and even has a couple of prototypes um, uh, where he shows some of his work. Um, the, there are the, but there are some challenging problems. Uh, the first challenging problem is um, with the garbage collection, and it's and the second one is performance. Now, garbage collection and performance also go hand in hand, but there are also some problems in the kernel where. Um, you really cannot suspend threads. Um, you have to make forward progress at certain times. So for example, when you're doing page file I.O., right? I mean, I'm writing to the page file um, to, to back up some memory, to free up some memory in the memory manager. You have to make forward progress. So you really cannot, at that point, um, say, oh, I cannot fail. I'm raising an exception. You know, you can't do that. Um, similarly, when you're, when you're um, there are times when, um, when the system is going to um, get an interrupt. And if you're running managed code in the interrupt and something happens, you get an exception. Um, uh, currently, the system, the operating system, is not built to handle an exception in the interrupt handler. You know, that's in fact, um, that is a fundamental uh, principle behind the way uh, OS is typically designed. Is that you never take an exception um, in inside uh, interrupt handler or um, at a, at a high that? interrupt. Because um, when you want to, well, there's no. Uh, it's mostly the way the architecture is designed. Um, Long term, you can imagine an operating system where this is possible, um, but the performance overhead of implementing that um, and is, is like very high, okay. right? So especially on a commercial kernel that's been out for a long time with um, baseline performance, right? You certainly don't want to um, do anything to disrupt that. So taking an exception in some interrupt service routine is actually a very fundamental uh, change. Mm -hmm. So but as I said, we are prototyping it. Um, mm -hmm. So that is one of the approaches. But we also have uh, projects where we are going to um, migrate drivers from uh, user mode, kernel mode to user mode. Um, so think about many of the USB devices that we have. Um, like, um, you know, uh, I used to have one here, like your camera, right? Sure. Um, or um, like, you know, your, uh, your mouse or keyboard, you know. Uh, many of these USB devices, um, they are protocol bus based, you know, um, and they really and they, they don't have like very tight latencies. Um, they they don't need access hardware registers, and so on. So it's actually 
um, foolish to actually expect um, move uh, make a uh, foolish right driver in kernel mode to support those um, devices. Um, we could really simplify the model by moving the um, uh, driver to user mode. Um, so that is exactly what we are trying to do. We are trying to move as many of the devices which don't have um, um, specific constraints um, to user mode. Um, all USB devices could be written in user mode, um, I think. Um, and all um, 1394 devices could be written in user mode. Um, 30, device drivers for 3094 devices could be written in user mode. Um, so many virtual serial port drivers could be written in user mode, and wow. so on. So in fact, in Longhorn, um, we are going to have drivers for media players, cameras, cell phones, all those things. And they'll all be written with user mode, our user mode driver framework. Fantastic. Um, so in fact, long term, I think that uh, only the only drivers for uh, storage, file systems, and uh, networking, and probably display, should be in kernel mode. You know, I believe that all other device classes could go to user mode. Really? You know, so um, imagine the the imagine how. So there are two benefits to that. First of all, um, bugs in drivers uh, don't crash the system. Uh, in fact, my primary goal is to improve driver quality. We want less blue screens. Sure. Um, and if you look at uh, the crash data. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the crashes are caused by um, bugs in device drivers. And since a driver is running in kernel mode, if there is a bug in it and it corrupts some memory, uh, there's no um, choice but to bug check the system because you don't want to propagate the error further. So we cannot record from that error. Mm -hmm. So we have to bug check the system. And that's why you see a blue screen and they have to reboot the system when a driver crashes. So by moving these drivers to user mode, we actually remove a whole bunch of code from the kernel. And that means that, um, you know, you have less bugs in the kernel, and so you'll have like less blue screens, right? So that's a direct benefit, awesome. and so that is um, that is in fact our primary goal is to make sure, uh, to actually improve the quality of drivers and Windows, and thus uh, improve the user end user experience. Now, which uh, so, what does that mean in terms of performance? Can you do this because of the the increase in processor speed and the increase in, in memory? So when the kernel obviously is the most performant place to be since. It's free reign, ring zero. Mm -hmm. You you own memory, you own it all. Right. So, explain. I mean, how did you get around the problem? How do you how do you move a kernel from? Sorry. How do you move a device driver from kernel mode to user mode? What does that look okay. like? Okay. So that's a good point. Um, I can probably use the blackboard. Sure. Right? Please do. Whiteboard. So, <clears throat> so the, we actually thought about this problem um, uh, for a while, and. So we decided that we only wanted to move the driver to user mode. We wanted to preserve everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, when you talk about uh, the I.O. system, um, there are a lot of things that go along with it. Um, so an, when an application talks to it, uh, does some I.O., it needs to know what device to talk to, right? It needs to know its name. Uh, there's security involved in it, right? And then there's like, you know, there's a plug and play events, like, you know, the device can arrive and go, uh, notifications and, and such things. And we decided that we want to leverage as much as possible, right? So you really want the application to not change at all. In fact, the application shouldn't care whether it's talking to a kernel mode driver or a user mode driver, right? Sure. So the way we do it now is actually by um, by doing some sort of a you know a proxy. So you have a uh, this, supposing this is the application. Um, um, so this is the user uh, kernel boundary. Then. Um, this is the I/O manager. So, if you had a kernel mode driver um, and this application was talking to it, then this driver would probably be sitting beside, b below the kernel mode, uh, below the I/O manager. Okay. So, if you want to write a user mode driver, um, what we do is we replace the kernel mode um, driver with what is called a reflector. Mm. And we reflect all IOs to a to a host process, and we we actually uh, load the driver inside the host process. Um, so the user mode driver is right here. Interesting. So um, to the so when so this essentially the the application is actually talking to a proxy driver, right? Mm -hmm. And this driver is um, is the one that takes care of all um, um, all the IOs and forwarding them to the reflector and back. Clearly, there's a performance uh, impact with this kind of an architecture, but um, but we find that um, if you look at a typical um, USB device or a typical um, 
many of the, the current serial buses, um, you can really maximize the throughput on the device, even though you are taking this overhead. Sure. And um, again, remember, NTIO is fully asynchronous. So while you may have a latency uh, increase, right, you can still maximize the bandwidth on the on the bus uh, because because you can uh, you can do a bunch of IOs, you can queue them all. Um, so um, so you really can. So we found out that, for example, we could actually maximize the throughput to a um, to actually a media player. Um, wow. You know, we can download music, you know, as fast as you could, whether it's a kernel mode driver or a user mode driver. Um, and so, but there are a lot of other advantages as well. Um, in the past. The application's behavior was actually at, at the mercy of the, of the driver inside the kernel. So the kernel had the, the driver was God. It could actually access all this address space. You know, it could do anything it wanted in the application. Um, and so, and that's why you know, if there is a bug in that driver, we bug check the system, right? Sure. But because of this approach, um, if this driver was behaving badly, we could in fact terminate this process, right, and restart it, right? And sure. we could, I mean, in fact, the rest of the system would still be available. You might see a disruption in the service for that particular device, you know, but you know, but the rest of the system is still continue running. And the application could actually actually handle yeah. the exception. Right. The application could get a failure saying, "Oh, your device went away," or yeah. we could say, "Your status device," you know, some something like that. Right. Excellent. And so the application could recover from the error and probably do something intelligent. Um, so that is um, that is our current uh, approach is to see, you know, if, if we can actually do this. Um, over time, we want to actually um, improve the performance. Like you know, the way to improve this is by using very smart um, um, inter-process communication mechanisms in the operating system. Okay. And we are also coming up with methods by which we can actually not copy buffers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like um, so. The important the important thing about any um, any any I/O system is to make sure that we can transfer bytes from one point to another. That's what I/O is. Sure. Right. Just transfer bytes from A to B. So. And we want to minimize as many buffer copies as possible. And so um, there are tech, uh, tips and techniques that we are thinking of um, and to improve that um, by providing handles and all sorts of things. Fantastic. So, um, so that's our current approach. But I can show you a user mode driver. Right? Absolutely. Let's check out a user mode driver. <laughs> 